Hello, friends. Welcome to this week's podcast of the Ocean Tribe Hangout. Um, so today we have an amazing guest. Her name is Dr. Put Dr. on her name, Ginelua Molopiane. She is an archaeologist and she is a, wait for it, a biological anthropologist. And um, so how I got to meeting Ginelua is an interesting story. The internet, obviously, Instagram, obviously, but also we were, she was chatting around how um, we often don't talk enough around how black people have, there's a connection when we look at the water space in relation to slavery. And I thought that was an interesting uh, perspective that she had as well, because it is a view that I hold, as everyone knows. But also she did underwater archaeology. So she's going to tell us a bit about that. But the, but so now she is on land and she doesn't do the water work anymore or as much or at the current moment. But I'm excited to have this conversation and let's see where we're going to go with it. Welcome to the podcast. Hold on, Dr. Genelwe. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm an archaeologist, a biological anthropologist. Uh, I, mean, I get called so many things, but generally my friends and fellow colleagues call me bones because that is what I do. I study bones that are found on archaeological sites. Um, it, that that's that's my thing, and that's why they call me bones. I I, I I love this this part because I want us to expand on how you one got to be this work and to do this work but to expand for us what it means to be a biological anthropologist but what archaeology even means but before we go there you have to tell us what is your thing what is your purpose maker what happens you know what is your happiness maker your your life bringer uh tell us what's your thing well, wow. okay. So, um, like most people, you have a professional life and a personal life. Yeah. So, you know, personally, my family is my happy maker. I love my family. I'm very, I'm a homebody. Um, professionally, it's exploration. I've been drawn to exploration since I was a child. And being out there and being outside in spaces that not a lot of people have been to or very few people have been to, really gets me excited to the point where I can't sleep at night because I'm like, oh my God, I'm going back into the cave. Like, yes, let's do this. So yeah, exploration and adventure is my thing. I, I love this, exploration and adventure. So I want to sit on that because exploration and adventure is so beautiful because, you know, the other day someone asked me about the world of firsts. And I said, we need to get past the world of firsts because once we, we are past the world of first person to do this and first person to do that, we begin to explore in a way that is different. And we begin to transverse worlds that we have never known and bring to life stories that have never been heard before. So what does it mean mm -hmm. to be an archaeologist? And what does it mean to be a biological anthropologist? I, I ain't trying to lie to anybody. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in my head trying to understand, you know, your work and I'm never going to try and behave like a clever when I don't even, you know, for me, I think it's, it's a crucial discussion to actually fully understand what it is that you do, but also for our listeners, because, you know, you're a new world to me and I'm stepping into new shoes because, because I found you on the internet. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so, so what is an archaeologist? The best way that I can, it's not, it's not the best way. It's the easiest way to explain this. Um, so archaeologists are scientists that study the human past. And we study this through the artifacts and the ancient ruins that we're finding um, out in the landscape or even underwater, which I did for a while. So think Indiana Jones and Lara Croft. Like, yes, there are movies, but what they do is what we do without getting shot by Nazis and people trying to kill us. So we go around um, uncovering ancient civilizations and artifacts, and then telling that story of a lost time uh, to future generations to ensure that that knowledge is still um, living forward in the future, right? So that's an archeologist. A biological anthropologist or 
um, a physical anthropologist or a bioarchaeologist, we come by very different names depending on which part of the country you're from or which part of the world you're from. Um, but biological anthropologists study bones and not just animal bones, we study human bones, like the human skeleton. So if a body washes up on the beach and there's no flesh on it other than bones, you would call a person like me or a forensic anthropologist and we'd study the bones. And we could tell if you're a male, female, if you're old or young, possibly where you're from, from like scientific analysis. Um, so yeah, so, you know, like the TV show Bones, where she's a forensic anthropologist and she solves murders using skeletons found from sites. That's what I do with uh, bones that we find from archaeological sites. That is amazing. That is just amazing. <laughs> Let me not lie to anybody. That's freaking amazing. We have to go back to, so I love the reference of Indiana Jones and Lara Croft because it helps people visualize the work that you do. And I think that is mm -hmm. amazing. But you told me a story of how you got to wanting to do this work, because if I have to go back and actually think through all the pages of my life, I cannot see this as, you know, as, 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 as a point that would have been an accessible career. You know, I often say that we grew up around being a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a policeman. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the ocean is still wild. And then you, you know, you go and you, you go into the most. How did you get to wanting to, to do this work? I was, I was seven years old when I decided I wanted to be an archaeologist. Um, I didn't know what archaeology was for a very long time. So it was a Saturday morning and I was watching cartoons with my mom. Uh, just before she went off to work and we stumbled across a cartoon series called The Adventures of Tintin. And the first episode that we watched was uh, Cigars of the Pharaoh. I actually have a poster of it in my office to remind me of where it is that I started. And uh, here it is, Cigars of the Pharaoh. Yo. Yeah. Okay. So that was the, the cartoon series that really started me off. And, you know, Tintin's not, he's not an archaeologist, he's a journalist, but he follows these stories that okay. lead him on adventures uh, to ancient civilizations and artifacts, and he solves mysteries. And I turned to my mom, I was like, I want to do that when I grow up. And my mom was like, oh, you want to be an archaeologist? And I was like, yes, that, that, that one, you know? Um, I couldn't pronounce the word archaeology for a very long time. I think I was maybe 12 or 11 where I could say archaeology. Um, but I was obsessed with this idea that you could learn so much about peoples just from artifacts and places. So I basically dedicated my entire life to archaeology. I was reading books during school. My English speeches were all about archaeology. Um, and then I got to university and I started studying archaeology. Um, and that's where I was introduced into things like uh, African archaeology, because a lot of the times when you're, when you're a kid and you say that you're interested in archaeology, you're thinking of Greece or the British Museum, uh, you know, things that are not Ooh. African like. Uh, so it was only at university where I was really introduced into the African side of archaeology, which is incredibly fascinating. Uh, and that's also where I got interested in bones as well. My parents are doctors, but I never really wanted to go the medical route. But here I was like, you can actually study bones from historical sites. And I was like, okay, that's cool. I can do that. Um, yeah. And then I did something crazy. Uh, so I did my master's in the UK on bones and then came back to South Africa. And I was just like, okay, I know I need to get a PhD if I really want to do this. But you know, in the meantime, while I'm looking for a PhD, let me just do something different. And then I signed up for an internship in Cape Town at the Iziko Museum of South Africa. And um, it was for an underwater archaeology project that they were running on. I knew how to swim, but I didn't know how to scuba dive. So I was thinking, oh, no, Oof. I'm just probably going to sit on the boat and take notes. OK, that's fine. I can swim. I'll be safe went through the whole interview process and you know I think the curator really liked me because he called back like quite shortly after my interview and he's like listen how do you feel about 
getting on a plane, coming to Cape Town, because I was living in Joburg at the time, come to Cape Town and learn how to dive so you can excavate a shipwreck underwater. And I was like, wow, are, are you sure you have the right person? And it's like, yeah, yeah, you, you're perfect. Just, just come and learn how to dive and you can actually do the work. And I was like, well, okay, wow. cool. I mean, let's just do this. Um, <laughs> and that was, that was my first introduction to underwater, you know, archeology span and yeah. being underwater. Um, I mean, I, I have a huge respect for the ocean. I love water. It's very calming, but you know, the mm. thought of going under it and actually being in the ocean is intimidating. And I often get intimidated whenever I go diving because the ocean is powerful. It can take you out if it needs to. So there's this level of respect that you have to have for it. But you know, once you calm yourself down, you actually realize what a magical place it is. Uh, one that's filled with joy, mm -hmm. excitement and trauma, unfortunately. Oh, filled with joy and trauma. You have to unpack that for us. Like, so number one, you know that I'm going to ask you, how was your diving experience? How was that first moment breathing underwater? And three, um, this, we need to then attach this trauma that you refer to, to your first experience. Expand for us when you say this joyous place. And I mean, absolutely, yes, the ocean is a place of joy and she is powerful. Expand on the trauma part. Mm, right. So, I mean, let's think about days on the beach, right? Day on the beach is a fun activity with your friends and family and you're just having fun in the sea, you know, a little mermaid, woohoo! getting wet and wild um and you know the the traumatic part uh, dawned on me so okay i'll also mention that i am a national geographic explorer i was made one in early early this year i was named a nat geo explorer and during the nat geo festival that i spoke at uh, there was a comment that there are not enough black people in underwater studies and we need to fix this. We need to encourage more black people to take part. And, you know, I just, I got really, really brave. I don't know, maybe I had one too many sips of coffee or wine or whatever. And um, I just, I, this is a, a talk where there are major people in Nat Geo, like the exec, old, um, old school explorers. And I was just like, you know what, instead of training, focusing so much on training underwater archaeologists who are of color, maybe we should consider the psychological impact the ocean has on people of color, because we have this thing called the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, where people of color were taken from their homelands on these ships on the ocean, yeah. and they'd never see home again, and their friends and family would never see them again. So there is this traumatic thing with the ocean being a very dangerous place, because if you go there, you might never come back. Um, so that was that was an interesting point that I, I brought up at Nat Geo, and people were like, oh, yeah, you're right. We actually didn't think of it that way. And I'm like, fair enough, yeah. because who wants to remember the, the slave trade? It's a very traumatic period. Nobody yeah. wants to think about it that way. But there really are some psychological scars that we're probably still dealing with today um, that determine how many black people actually have a healthy relationship with the ocean. So everything that you've said is just so incredibly important because in my work, I realized that as I speak to black and brown people from across the world, right across the world, mm -hmm. you realize that there is this fear that we grow up around, but also they, they, there's the common thread that also speaks of the stories that we hear in relation to the ocean. Don't go to the ocean because there's a snake that lives there. Don't go to the ocean because mm. you'll be taken. Don't. There's all of these stories that 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 keep on mm -hmm. affirming the idea that we shouldn't be there. But then also when you stop and you rattle the cage a bit, you say, I kind of thought that it was a South African thing that, you know, when people say black people and water, maybe they just mean us here in South Africa. And very quickly you realize that it's not just South Africa, it's the world. 
And what does it mean for us to be walking around with incomplete narratives as a way in which we reposition black people in relation to water? You know, mm-hmm. so there's South Africa who has her own struggles, right? We can, we can talk about the transatlantic slave trade, but then we also need to talk about South Africa who has her own troubles in relation to the water from when you look at the apartheid government where people were physically dispossessed of lands and moved from ocean spaces where you could face jail time for being at the beach that you grew up at. And all of a sudden that place is not accessible to you anymore. And so what does it mean when we enter the space, even with new aspirations, when even let's say we grow up like here in South Africa, you might have more brown communities that have access to the ocean, but again, from a place of sustenance. So it's again, not Mm -hmm. recreational. It says, you know, I'm getting, um, you know, I'm a fisherman. Um, You know, you're collecting new ways to sustain your family. It's again, not recreational. And the way in which you engage the water is different, you Mm -hmm. know? And so what does it mean for us to pull the needle through the various threads of seeking to complete the story? And so I love I love the the boldness of the moment that says, hey, what would happen if we took a few steps back to say what happens to the black psyche in in relation to its history, to the present versus what we want in the future? And can we can we secure a beautiful place for that exploration and healing in the work that we're trying to do and the future that we're trying to build? It's powerful. Yeah, yeah. It really is. Um, and also, I think we need to be very careful uh, in how we do this, because yes, this, this grand idea that we have, that we want to see more black people having a very healthy relationship with the ocean, not just in terms of sustenance, but um, recreation as well, like really exploring yeah. it and making making it their own. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, we can't do too much too quickly. Um, so it's, it's like you were saying, we're now in a generation of first. There's always the first black woman to do this, the first black person to do this. Um, and I mean, I've all, often been told that, oh, are you the first black lecturer uh, teaching the subject? Or are you the first black underground astronaut? And I'm just like, you know what? I'm so tired of hearing the word the first. It shouldn't even be a thing, but also I'm riding that wave of being the first because I'm just like, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe that's that's our our job, you know, our generation. We are tasked to being the first of something so that future yeah. generations have a reference point or role models yeah. to look like. So when I was a child, I didn't have role models in archaeology that looked like me. To yeah. be fair, I wasn't really searching that hard. I just, I knew what I wanted to be. But a yeah. theme that has come across many of the students that I've taught is that they don't often see black archaeologists out there or black yeah. biological anthropologists. And that representation really does matter. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's something that I'm really trying to grapple with at the moment and accept and embrace it just by being out there so that people see me, um, cause that's going to inspire somebody else, some yeah. other little kid to follow my footsteps. Yeah. So I, I love, I love, you know, it's an interesting thing, the, the space of firsts. And, and I keep on saying that undiverse spaces can be unknow- unknowingly and possibly ignorantly very violent to black bodies because Hmm. there are ways in which they have conducted themselves before there was the person who comes from a different place, who is black, who has experienced different levels of oppression. So the way in which it, it's often not inclusive. So you become the first in the line of the people that will come after you, but no one realizes the pressure that is also on your shoulders as a first. And because Hmm. representation is important, we are tasked with stretching past the narrowed walls of the ideals of how black people should be in these particular spaces as they enter the space. And so sometimes it looks like assimilation. Sometimes it looks like 
a need for proximity to the ideals of the space in order for you to survive in that space. And, and I think that is the, the difficulty that I, I can say for myself, I've experienced. And I always say, what does it mean for me to do the work anyway and, and stay where I can? And when I leave, seek to charter a path that allows for the space to be safe for the black and brown bodies that will follow my steps. You know, because it would be unfair to be here and do all this work without recognizing that if I don't make the space wider for those who come after me, what have I done? You know, as we look at, you know, it was it was Women's Day recently. And I always say I take courage from the woman who who marched and spoke and used their voices and their bodies to speak against uh, systems that were not inclusive, oppressive and, you know, were seeking to minimize the idea of how black people and black and brown bodies would exist in South Africa. Without their voices, who would we be today? These big dreams, mm. these big worlds that we live in, who would we be? And so I often say we have a responsibility in that even when it is referenced that Dr. Ginello was first, it is important that we attach to that the work of, of our bodies. And even though our bodies might go through a lot in the fact that past your ability to be the all the intelligence that you are. When you walk into the room, you're still a black woman. You're still black first. And then maybe you'll open up your mouth and someone's like, woo, girl, you know, hold up on that English or hold up on all of that intelligence or hold up on, oh my word. Um, but what you're still first is black and you can never take that off whenever it is, wherever it is that you go. Yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't take it off, eh? Like, I'm black, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it's funny, it's really funny because when I studied in the UK, so I did a lot of my interviews over the phone. So I'd be talking to people over the phone, and this was back in the day where we didn't have um, Zoom or anything like that. It was Skype. And yeah, I was... I was a, an honor student at the University of Pretoria at the time, so I didn't have like the best internet connection. So the best I could do was to go to the um, school library and log on with like a microphone attached to the computer and to talk. So yeah. I think I think a lot of I don't know if it was the lecturers or some of the students they thought that oh her English is so good. We're, we're now going to expect, you know, like a white girl to pull through. Yeah. And then who comes to class? Me, black girl with like short red hair because, you know, I've, I've been channeling Ariel since circa 2005. I've always had red hair. So I like to say that my natural hair color is red and people often laugh at me. But anyway, like people are Love shocked it. when, you know, they speak to me on the phone and then they see me, they're like, no, your accent doesn't match. And I'm like, what's that supposed to mean? Number one, what is exactly. that supposed to mean? <laughs> you know, um, and it, you know, it, it is very difficult in, it shouldn't be difficult, but it is often difficult that when you are a person of color in these very high, high spaces or spaces that are not designed for people of color to succeed at, and then you're succeeding and then your fellow colleagues or other people are just like, no, something, no. How, how did you get here? Like, mm. did somebody do you a favor? And I'm like, no, bro. Yeah. No, I, I worked to be yeah. here. And then you show <laughs> them that you actually worked to be here. And then they try yeah. to sabotage you. And you're just like, and now you have to be the better person, right? You have to be the better person. Be like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to reiterate my my authority very kindly upon yeah. you and remind you that um, I'm here to stay. I'm not going anywhere. So I've always uh, uh, had that attitude where I don't back out. I will leave on my mm. own terms if I want to. And, and this is the thing, right? The idea of how people place assumptions on your body. So one, you sound a certain way. So there's already a myriad of expectations surrounded completely around assumption around your body and your existence and then there's the space of needing to fight for your own voice where the the continuous space is asking you to prove um Kenelu, are you still there yeah i'm still here 
Okay. Still um, here, still and here. so this continuous world keeps on... Okay. This world just keeps on asking you to prove your no. Before you can be seen, you could have the doctor title and you're always still asked to prove your no, which is interesting. And, you know, when you speak about everyone asks the question of how did you get there? Like, who's your proximity that allows you to claim the space? That is something that I'm still battling with. But tell me about your underwater archaeology experience. No, 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 no. Before we even go there, tell us about your scuba diving journey, that first breath underwater, and the many times that you revisited this, play, this place. How was it for you? And in retrospect, what do you think is probably one of the wildest things that you take back from, from, from that experience? Yeah, yeah. Like diving has been, I think, one of the most exciting things that I've done, other than um, working at Rising Star Cave. Um, so it must have been 2012, 2011, 2012, uh, where I first learned how to dive. And I did this at the University of Cape Town in their underwater unit. Yeah. And this was a month long course of diving every day, seven days a week for a month. I was underwater. Yeah. Um, and it was incredible. I mean, to get fit for a class five. Class five, class four, scuba license, so that scientific um, diving license. To get fit was a mission. Um, you need to be like super, super fit, but I dedicated myself to it. And I got through the intro of the, of the course, and I were learning how to dive. And I had been swimming for a very long time. I started swimming when I was still in school. So I was very familiar and comfortable with water. But now I had to learn how to breathe underwater which so one of the instructors pete he likes to say that you know when people put their heads underwater they become stupid there's there's something that with our heads submerged we stop <laughs> thinking logically and you have to train your brain to think logically like you can breathe it's fine like you don't have to do anything crazy just breathe and act normal so so that was yeah. Yeah. the one thing i had to like learn how to do is to breathe underwater and to be smart underwater, right? Um, so that was interesting. And we did lots of like incredible things. I remember us going to Colk Bay and standing on the harbor wall with all our gear on and the ocean is roaring underneath us. And Peter's like, okay, you need to jump in and then build like a little octo on the ocean floor. And I looked at the ocean, I looked at Pete, I was like, are you sure? You sure you want me to jump off from the harbor wall into, he's like, yeah, yeah, with all, with all my gear on. He's like, yeah, yeah, you trained for this. I was like, yeah, wow. okay. So there I am with my regulator in my mouth, my, my cylinder on my back, and I'm just like, I'm praying. I'm like, oh, Father God, please don't let me die this way. You jump <laughs> in and I'm screaming, screaming into my regulator. <laughs> You know, but like that was fun. That was that was really fun. Things that normal people don't do, right? I've been on night dives. Night diving is the bomb. Like the ocean is so dark, and then you shine your light, and you just see all this wildlife around you, and you're like, "Wow, that is incredible. That is that is sick." Um, so yeah, I mean, I've I've had so much fun in the ocean. Um, funny enough. I do get seasick, like I get nauseous, even underwater. And I've had to learn coping mechanisms to deal with that whilst I'm excavating uh, a boat or whatever it is that I'm assigned to do um, for that trip. Yeah. But it's just been incredible. Um, I'd love to go back. Uh, I left underwater archaeology to pursue my PhD degree which was on bones. Mm. Um, but I've never kept too far away from being um, underwater. Yeah. I used to teach the course um, and take students on field work for underwater archaeology at university. Uh, and that's something that I think I will revive uh, in a couple of years once I have the funding, because that's another thing about diving um, and who it is accessible to is that it's super expensive. Mm. It is so expensive having yeah the wetsuit, the BC, the regulators, um, charting out a boat to get you there. 
it's incredibly expensive. Um, and I think that's something that does need to be tackled so that the ocean is easily accessible to people of color as well. Yeah, Th that is such a, an important part of the whole discussion when we're talking scuba diving, right? Because we're always saying, make it accessible, make it accessible, make it accessible. But no one actually has the discussion about the costs that are associated with being able to dive. Um, you know, you, you could get one dive can be 500 bucks. It can be 800 bucks, depending where you are. And that yeah. makes it inaccessible to the greater community. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting that you speak about being seasick. I remember being sick for the longest time. I, I often say that I have vomited probably half my size in like, you know, just because when you're out at sea and you just look around and you're like, so one plus one equals pearl, you know, a yes. hundred times. <laughs> yum, 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 yum. And, 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 and I was saying to someone that I never thought that my sea legs would ever arrive because every single time from the first time I dived, they took my gear off my back. And I just remember turning around and hurling for what felt like 20 minutes as my dive master. Luckily, he spoke Zulu because I don't think I would have heard anything else. And he was like, no, Glungile, Kubega, just, you know, in between, look underneath because you're feeding the fish. And I would be hurling and then I look under and all of these fish are like, pop, 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 pop. And I thought, this is awkward. This is disgusting, but okay. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and probably a year later, uh, I sat there and I was like, oh my God, I didn't vomit today. You know, and, 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 and the air for me in the beginning, my throat would get dry. I don't know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. And that's what would be bringing on the nausea that would happen when I get to the top. It was almost like my body had to get used to this external source of air. And, and, and I guess maybe it does make sense because the air is slightly colder. It's not like room yeah. temperature air. Yeah. And I might be wrong. Maybe the scuba diving people will come for me. But I think with the air being compressed, it is slightly a bit colder. And there is a place where your body needs to learn to connect this, this, this not as natural, but natural mm -hmm. air. Yeah, yeah, no, agreed. There, there is, you have to learn how to breathe differently, right? Yeah. Uh, when you're scuba yeah. diving versus when you're on, on the surface. And, you know, I marvel at people that don't get seasick. I really do. Like, I thought, I, I really thought I was not going to be one of those people. Because that was also <laughs> like part of the interview question. They're like, do you yeah. get seasick? And I was like, no. I, I don't no. Get, I've been on boats before. I don't get seasick. Oh, put me underwater. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Uh, <laughs> no, but um, I think one of the funniest things is just realizing how um, how tiny you are, right? So there's the ocean that makes you feel tiny like this. But then there's the secondary when you when you hurl so much that you end up at heaving. I don't know if yours got like really hectic, but mine would get so hectic that I would hurl everything and all that would be left would be heaving. So your body is like, you know, you're half shaking Dry heaving and, and you're, you're like, just <gasps> heaving. And yes, and there's nothing left. And you're just thinking, <laughs> this is what my life has come to. This is me. This is me in the middle of the ocean and I can't keep it together. And everyone's like, Shame, are you okay? Are you okay? And you're like, I'm clearly not. <laughs> oh my gosh, guys. No, it was a mess. No, it was a mess, guys. It was a mess. <laughs> and you know what makes it worse is that people are there, they're watching you, they're caring about you, and you're like, No, I am hardcore, leave me alone. <laughs> Oh my word! No, guys, it, it, it's it's a world. And recently, I think it was like a few months ago, maybe four or five months ago, I came across a girl who was on the boat, and she got so sick, right? She hurled, 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 and through the dry heaving, ends up laying on the side of the boat, and she was tiny, and you just see her little body dry heaving, and I just thought, oh my word. This is the pits and I will never go back to these pits. But what does it mean to support her based on what, you know, I've learned? So I'm like, 
you know, maybe you don't want to lay on the boat. Maybe you want to sit up so you can see the shore and that helps your body equalize. It can, it can mm-hmm. see where land is and that helps. But anyway, let's put that aside. Tell us about your most, tell us about your work on that, on the boat that landed somewhere here in Cape Town that linked back to the slave trade. Uh, tell us about that. How was that experience for you as well? Right. So this was my first experience in underwater archaeology. Like before then, I I didn't know what it was or I knew what it was, but I had no experience in it. Um, so the yeah. project that the Zika Museum was involved with partnered up with George Washington University and the yeah. Smithsonian Institute, particularly the yeah. African American, the National African American History Museum. Um, and there was, so they, they have this uh, project, which is still running. It's called the African Slave Works Project. Uh, and it's also with um, another organization called Diving with a Purpose, uh, which uh, they focus specifically on black scuba divers uh, in America. And they were, they were looking for a particular boat called the Sao Jose, which was en route from Mozambique, I think, Mozambique or Madagascar, and it was coming up through the through the coast to Cape Town as a refresher station, and then be off to the Americas to drop off its slaves there. Um, it didn't quite make it. It didn't even make it to Cape Town, let's be fair. It, it was sailing along Clifton, and if anybody knows Clifton, yes, it's a posh beach, but it's also quite hectic. Um, the seas there are, are, yeah, it's a washing machine. My friend and I, Sophie, who was my dive partner, we called it the washing machine because every time we went down there, we would just be tumbling the entire time. Yeah. Um, so the boat didn't even make it to the to the harbor in Cape Town. It crashed in Clifton. And it was said that there were about 400 slaves that were registered sure. on that boat and none of them survived. Uh, and so because of my human remains background, uh, we were tasked with finding, okay, can we find any evidence that there were, there were slaves on board and can we find their bodies? Is there any evidence of their bodies either on the beach or in the ocean where we think the site was? So our job was to find the, the ship, which we did. We found pieces of it because, you know, Clifton mm. is kind of rough. So we found pieces of the ship. We also found um, some shackles. So there had been iron shackles that we found um, on the ocean floor, but no bodies. There were absolutely no bodies found. So we couldn't conclusively say that everyone drowned or all the slaves drowned on board. They could have survived. They could have made it onto shore. Maybe some of them were buried on the beach and then sold in Cape Town as slaves, because we know Cape Town is actually a colony of, of slaves. Almost everyone in Cape Town who was of color was a slave at some point or another. Um, sure. so, so that was that was the Sao Jose project. And the first time I did underwater archaeology and first time I got to work with the Smithsonian Institute. And I, I'd always been interested in the slave trade, but not to the extent where I'd be looking for bodies. That was yeah. that was something else for me. Um, even though at the back of my mind, I knew, listen, I'm looking for bones, but bones are not, the chances of finding bones underwater is very slim. But you have to look anyway, you have to look. Um, yeah. And we didn't find anything, like nothing. Yeah. We found pieces of the boat, like I said, cannonballs, balustrades, shackles, but nothing that represented these people, nothing that would say that we could take back to whichever country they came from and be like, sorry, here, here, there are these, immortalize them in some way or remember them in some way. There was nothing like that. Wow. Uh, Sure. So, (laughs) sure. That was a lot. Um, It's, it's an interesting thing how I always say that the ocean is a spiritual place for me, right? And mm. when I go in, I ask for permission. When I come out, I give 
gratitude because I recognize the privilege that it is to be there while fully aware of the pain that these waters have witnessed of bodies that look like mine, right? And so what does it mean to, to bridge the gap, right? And, and, and I just, I actually cannot imagine the multiple levels of, the multiple places I would need to go if I had to do any kind of work like that, because it's not only your body that is in that water, but your, your spirit, your bloodline, there is so much to it more than just the bones, right? And what does it mean mm. to, to honor the space and to honor the, the pain? You know, I always say if the, if the sea could speak, she could speak of human atrocities that we cannot even imagine. Because when you picture yeah. these boats that have come from far, at any point when the, you know, the boat is in trouble, black bodies are being thrown out. If someone is sick, uh, you know, more black bodies are being thrown out. And, and if it just had to witness humanity in those pockets of time, I don't think we would ever rid ourselves of and it's a, it's, it's a whole thing as humanity. I don't think we could be, ever be able to scrub that off our bodies. And, and thank <sighs> God she doesn't speak because I, I, I don't think we have space. You know, she speaks differently. But if she had to be like, I'm going to court to tell on all of y'all, it would be over for all of us as humanity because I don't think we'd be able to, to swallow the truth of and the depth yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it wouldn't of even just be white people that are guilty. There would be some black yeah. people that would be guilty as well. I mean, you captured these people and you sold them. You knew what was going to happen. 100%. And, and that's, what, that's why I say, like, it would be an entirety of humanity where all of us would reel and not just make it through. But so that that just sounds wild and i think while i'm here in cape town i'm gonna find a way to to get closer to that place and just yeah and just kind of um i don't know be 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 in it so i'm gonna lift the space a little and ask the question if a human is listening so you know that I work with younger humans in Langa and we, we are exploring the ocean and we're snorkeling and we, we are trying to bridge the gap. And I think that for me is my work. What does it mean to bridge the gap and build a connection with the ocean, this ocean space being deeply a place that we've been told to keep away from, stay away from, you shouldn't be there. What does it mean to build this connection that allows us to dream new, part one, but part two, become active participants as, as advocates and ocean conservationists of, of and in our own areas. I think that is powerful. So if, if one of the humans are wanting to go into the work that you do, um, what subjects do they take in school and what do they look at when they get to university? And, and yeah, give us a guideline point, like a little pinpoint of where do you start to, to do the amazing work that you do. So, so archaeology is considered a science, so some of the subjects that you should be taking in school is math, science, uh, geography, and biology, All right? Those are the four subjects that I took um, at school. And, and during my time, so I studied at the University of Pretoria, um, what I needed to do in order to get into the course that offered archaeology was reach the end score. So I needed to reach a certain number of points in order to register for that course. Um, so that's step one, or step two actually, do the subject and then make sure you have enough points in order to uh, get into that subject, right? And then, and those are the two easy bits really. Uh, now that you're in the course, this is where the hard part starts because um, I feel like a lot of students are expecting just to study hard to be like a level students and then they're going to make it in the field which is not true which much like diving in order to become good at it you need to practice it right so you need yeah. to volunteer to go on all these field trips to to do crazy things uh, whether it's something that you're well versed in or not 
Um, I wasn't well versed in underwater archaeology, but I did it because, you know, it was going to be a new skill, which would in, then later help me to become an underground astronaut, uh, most famous with the Homina Lady discovery. And of course, I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, it, it helped, that skill helped. So you have to build up these skills that you might think are not useful now, but they will be in the future. So always be active, always be proactive and get into people's faces and get them to recognize you and to see the potential in you. And it's the only way to make it, I feel. Uh, I, I love this so much. Get in people's faces because that's the way that you, you arrive at where you want to be. Thank you so much for giving us that, um, that information. So as we roll up to a close, I love to ask this question because because of the different the the different walks of life that we're at um the ability to convey a message that anybody listening can take and use where they are to advance themselves i love to ask if you had anything that you wanted to leave with our guests what with our listeners what would it be it can be in relation to your career your personal life um, or just in relation to getting to where you are today, um, what 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 would you say to the people listening? So one of the few things that I I took with me going through my PhD towards the end, um, where you just want to give up, mm -hmm. and I mean obviously everyone tells you don't give up, just just keep going, keep going. Um, and also, you know, there, there'll be some times where opportunities are given to you, but you need to get through that one hurdle in order to get to that opportunity. Don't waste time. That's what I have to say, because every opportunity has a shelf life. As much as you don't want to hear it, but there will be someone after you who will make use of that opportunity if you don't. Not saying that we should backstab each other, but if you have an opportunity, use it. You know, take it yeah. and use it and use that opportunity to help other people get to where you are. And that's how we build a supportive community. So use the opportunities that are placed in front of you so that you're able to essentially pass the ladder down in order for everyone to be able to come up and join you and do amazing things because that's how we build community. With that said, thank you so much, Dr. Kinelwe. I think what, what I've taken from this conversation is the idea of perseverance, uh, you know, keep on going regardless of how hard it is, but to go into the places that you never ever think possible. But also when you're watching cartoons, realize that the, uh, hold on that takes me to this important place everything that you watch can be intentional because look at how the the cartoons that you watched have shaped your thinking to becoming the woman that you are today and so i want to thank you for the work that you do i want to thank you for expanding my world there's something that i say that like when you come across a different world we begin to step into shoes that we've never ever imagined. And for you to be a black woman is so powerful for me because I get to stand in those shoes. And because you have arrived, I have arrived. And I think that is such a powerful thing. And so I hope you continue to multiply in the way that you already are doing. And, and I celebrate you. I celebrate your work. I celebrate your existence. I celebrate your truth. And I celebrate your life and the body that you are that will keep on showing up in spaces and breaking down barriers. I celebrate you, and I thank you for this time. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's the worst. <laughs> oh. For me, it's just to always be grateful because where we come from, I keep on saying we remain the wildest dreams and the ability to be able to live in this truth and, and these worlds that I could have never imagined for myself 
And as I speak to you today, reimagining anew is a gift. And so I thank mm. you. <laughs> shall we, shall we, with that, we will close. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see everybody next week. Yes, guys. Thank you so much, Sandy. <laughs> Oh, it's been lovely. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you next week. If you have any questions, you can find Dr. Kinelio. I'll put her social media links at the bottom of this podcast. Find her, uh, ask her all the questions that you have, and uh, go for gold. Cheers.